My name is uh, Tinko Azmil. I'm an executive director with uh, Kazana National, uh, which is a sovereign uh, investment arm of uh, the Malaysian government. Uh, myself, I oversee our uh, technology investments uh, and have been doing so for the last uh, five years or so. I'm Inglan from Sequoia Capital. Sequoia Capital is a 45-year-old uh, venture capital fund, uh, originally started in Menlo Park, uh, but now have presence in India, China, uh, Israel, and now Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, I, I, oh, I started the office in, in Southeast Asia. You know, companies that we have been involved with include uh, Tokopedia in Indonesia, Gojek, uh, Carousel in Singapore, and of course, KFIT in Malaysia. Okay, great. Well, th thank you for that, gentlemen. Maybe to get us started, I would be very interested to hear from you in Southeast Asia, what are some of the most important tech trends that you see that are worth investing in over the next five or 10 years? Maybe we can start with Asmo. Yeah, I think um, when we look at the region, I think one of the, the big shifts is really uh, still the, the offline, online shift. I think, I think uh, Patrick mentioned earlier in terms of the mobile phone usage and so on, I think that's that's a trend that continues to increase more and more. And I think we're going to see more and more adoption of people going straight uh, from offline into mobile. And I think that's one of the, for me, one of the big trends to, to watch out for. Yeah, sure. I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be a disappointing answer because, you know, I always get questions on, you know, what is hot in Lan? And, you know, the, I think the truth is that, you know, we, we know black swans are going to happen, you know. But if you ask me before we met, the carousel guys in uh, a coffee shop in Orchard Road, whether people will start taking photos of uh, their old goods and sell it on the mobile, the answer is probably no. You know, if you ask me whether, you know, before we met the Gojek guys in, uh, you know, Starbucks in Jakarta, on whether they will be the, you know, de facto transportation network in um, Indonesia, uh, the answer is probably no. So it's actually founders that point us, you know, new trends, you know, it's, they're plagued by a problem they're particularly troubled with, and they are proxy for a few, few, few million, you know, few hundred, other, few hundred million other people. Um, but I do want to point out two, two big trends, which is that you know, the, um, the, the, in, the PC took 20 years to reach 100 million users. The internet took uh, seven years to reach 100 million users. But the mobile, mobile only took three years to reach 100 million users. So the velocity of change is very, very fast. I think the second big trend is uh, you know, SaaS. So there's about uh, you know, we believe that there will be about a hundred, uh, there's already hundred billion dollar of wealth created in tech market cap in the software as a service. The recurring revenue team used to be the case where, you know, sales is uh, accounted for, you have, you have new sales every quarter, but now it's, uh, you know, with, with SaaS software as a service, it's recurring revenue. So we believe there's another 900 billion of market cap created in software as a service, you know. So there's two big general trends. Fantastic, thank you. We're very lucky to have Mukul from Temasek with us as well. I'm going to let... Uh, Maybe Mukul will give a, just a two-minute introduction of himself, and uh, we'll, we'll introduce him to some questions, too. Sure. S sorry for being late. Uh, uh, it's sort of awkward to walk into a panel that you're supposed to speak on in the middle of it. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, so as, as, as Jan mentioned, I, I work for Temasek. Uh, we've been relatively large um, investors um, in the region, but in few assets, right? I think we, we tend to write larger checks, later stage uh, uh, deals. So, so you'll see us do fewer, larger deals. In fact, I was looking at a ranking of sort of investors in the in the tech space, and I think we would probably rank um, third after after SoftBank and Alibaba in dollars, um, uh, but would be far behind someone like Sequoia in terms of number of deals. Um, so, so I think um, um, uh, you know uh, we have a pretty active tech practice. We'd be excited to meet with any number of you guys out here um, uh, going forward. Great. While you have the mic, Mukul, maybe just, uh, which is interesting for the audience, is to hear a little bit from the three of you about how you spot a good management team and what scares you off in terms of a bad management team as you're evaluating investments. Should I start? Um, so, you know, I think, I think a good management team, it's, it's interesting. You know, we, we often start by looking at sort of, you know, how a management team is able to think through structural advantages that they can build in a business. Uh, as, as I think has been pointed out through many examples today, it's, uh, it's very rare that the initial business plan you start with is what you eventually end up doing, right? Lots of things will change over time. Lots of things will, will evolve over time. 
So I think flexibility is the second thing, right? So I think, I think what we're really looking for are management teams who, who have passion, clearly. That's, uh, that's also been talked about this morning. I think it's people who are flexible, who are able to respond to, uh, to, to input, uh, both from us, but more importantly, from the changing circumstances around, uh, around them. And then ultimately, people who are able to think about long-term, sustainable um, sort of structural advantages that they can build. Because we, um, like a lot of investors here, are making long-term illiquid bets. And um, you know, when you're making long-term illiquid bets, you have to be able to kind of think through um, structural advantages that will outlast whatever the current moment uh, uh, suggests. Ian, let's, sure. let's go back this way. I, I think our most successful founders has always been, you know, rebels. You know, they are not that we call them. You know, they've been often been called misfits. Uh, they are not the popular kids in school. You know, they are the person that sits in a quiet corner in the classroom. You know, uh, and, and I think they grew up with the fact that they, there's a need to win rather than a want to win. They grew up with something that they need to prove a point. And you know, I think one of the one of the things that we, we see a lot in, in our founders is that they, they are people who can you know make a decision at nine o'clock in the morning and execute by noon, uh, being able to iterate very fast as Muku has pointed out um, to, to new data. Uh, I think the third point is that they are also they have also clarity of thought. They are able to uh, explain you know very complicated business concept and distill it into the key fundamentals. Um, they are often also sometimes they are often good listeners. They talk they, they listen more than they talk. Uh, and, and they, uh, they execute, and in, they, are, they are leaders that uh, people will follow uh, through thick and thin. Great. Excellent. Yeah, I think um, for me, the, what, what constitutes a, a good management team really depends on the type of company and what they're trying to do. Uh, but some of the key themes that come through all the time, uh, one is, is they really need to have a passion for the business that they are, are doing, what they're promoting. Uh, again, we've, we've met you know, some companies in the past where it became clear to us that the founders were only interested in sort of the big payday at the end. Uh, if it's just about the money, it, 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 we've never seen that really work out in the end. Uh, so you, you need really to have a passion for what you want to do. Uh, the best management teams are the ones that have a very clear vision for what they want, but on the other hand are also very flexible when times change, when things are not working really have that flexibility and agility to, to turn the business around. Uh, and I think, you know, some, uh, the, the, the good ones really uh, also look to, you know, this is where I am and where do I need to go next? They're always moving forward. Standing still isn't good enough for what they are. Uh, I remember uh, sitting again uh, with uh, a very large company. I think it was on, on uh, Patrick's unicorn list uh, earlier this morning where you know, we, we had an hour with them and they spent 45 minutes talking about how bad all their competitors were uh, and really spent no time at all talking about why, why they were a good company. And that was really a, bit, a big, a big uh, put off. Yeah. Actually, Tengon as well, th thank you for the, the second part of that answer. So it's, it's interesting to see all three of you agree on passion and flexibility. And it's, it's good that talking bad about the competition is one thing that you don't like. I wanted to ask uh, you, Ling Yang, what is something that a management team may do? Maybe just one small example that turns you off the management team a little bit. Mm, sure. Uh, actually, I have, a, I have a good story for that. Um, you know, I, I'm on a board of a company called uh, Appear, which is a leading AI company um, you know, in, in, in Asia. And they didn't start off with that. They, the, the founder is a PhD from Harvard. Uh, with, you know, he has a pu many published papers in machine learning, I triple E, and you know, I think that when he first became an entrepreneur, he said, "Hey, you know, that was a time when you know, gung ho and puzzles as dragons, all these gaming companies were were very hot and fashionable." So he started a gaming company. Um, so you know, I think to your question, one of the things that I, I gave him very tough feedback, they said, "Hey, you know, you with your background, I don't know why you are doing a gaming company. Why do you consider, um, uh, you know?" adapting or employing some of your skill sets to serve gamers. Um, and, and, you know, I, I didn't think he would listen. But I think that's also a manifestation that a lot of entrepreneurs, they, you know, the chase where the big funding rounds are happening, you know, the $1 billion investment, in, and then they try to uh, clone, clone some of these businesses and, and go, go where the business is going. And to finish out the story, you know, he actually listened. So he pivoted the business, 
he became a, you know, a, a, a cross-screen targeting service uh, built on the AI platform, um, you know, and it's doing very well. Uh, I mean, they, we just closed 23 million round with uh, UOB last year. The company is uh, growing three, four times a year. And it, so it pivoted from a gaming company to become an AI company with gaming companies as their customers. I think that's the, that's the point, to, to not follow the trends blindly, but to look at your own competitive advantage uh, and, and do something you're really passionate about. Great. Mukul, is there any one-line example of anecdotically of something that happened once where you thought, I, I'm, I'm going to be a bit careful and, or not invest here? With, maybe without names, so the example yeah, can be harsh. No names. I think you meet, you meet entrepreneurs who are pitching the flavor of the month, right? And the flavor of the month changes every month, as expected. And, and so, you know, you hear a story that's evolved from one hot thing to the next, um, and that, uh, to the point made earlier, is usually a sign of somebody who's trying to make a quick buck as opposed to go after a big problem. That's the number one thing I'd walk away from. It's actually interesting that, that all three of you are, are quite similar in what you like and what you don't like, and then maybe picking up on your flavor of the month, I, I did have one question that, that does interest me personally. When I started investment banking, I guess, 24 years ago, and you went to a big investor and you said, here's a great company, but they're breaking all kinds of regulations everywhere, then you would be thrown out of the building. Why are you even coming showing me this rubbish, Jan? <laughs> right? uh, we can't do it. And now you look at businesses like Uber and Airbnb who are out innovating regulation. And so it's, it's questionable about you know, in certain jurisdictions, and they're creating something so popular that the regulation does catch up and it allows it. But there is a period where you're basically funding regulation to catch up with you. How, how do you view that? I don't know if you call it a gray zone, a black zone, an undefined zone. How do you think about that? And, and how do you then invest? Maybe we start with you, Mukul. I think there is a, there is a distinction between breaking laws and regulation not having caught up, right? And I think Airbnb is a good example. We're investors in Airbnb. Uh, the truth is Airbnb's um, regulatory setup in Singapore is a gray zone. It isn't 100% clear yet. Uh, we're investors there, um, and, and I think um, we understand, or at least try to understand, or make that distinction between breaking laws and waiting for a regulatory uh, um, sort of uh, situation to catch up. The, the second point I'll make, which is also an Airbnb point, it's a good example, uh, is that, you know, I've known Brian Chesky for many years, and we ultimately invested, invested last year. Um, Sequoia was smart to do it much, much before us. Um, but the reason why we didn't invest earlier is because there was massive concentration around specific geographies, New York in particular, where the regulatory picture has been unclear for the last seven years, right? And it still is. Um, now, the risk of that setup seven years ago when, you know, 65% of your revenue was New York versus today where a much smaller percentage, low single digits is from New York, is very different. So the one level is, uh, I guess, uh, to answer your question, the three levels are, are you breaking a law that's different from saying, it has regulation caught up with what you're doing? Second is, um, um, if regulation hasn't caught up, I think we, we, will, we will step forward. And third is we have to assess, as with any other investment, whether that risk is disproportionate to the reward. I, I would argue that with Airbnb four or five years ago, that was a disproportionate risk. Today, it has gotten substantially mitigated. Yeah, I, I think thank you, Muku, for, for flagging out a case study because uh, I think Airbnb is a close uh, case study to my heart because when I first started at Sequoia four years ago, that was my first assignment to actually... Uh, you know, Mike Moritz gave me a call and said, hey, my, uh, Airbnb is a very important company for Sequoia. We're the largest shareholders. Uh, you know, they are thinking of setting up operations in, in, in Asia. Uh, you know, please bring Brian Chesky around to all the key regulators. So, you know, we, we, we brought the CEOs and, and key management of Airbnb around. We hired their first employee in, in, in Singapore um, and actually Asia. Uh, I think one of the key learnings is that it take, always takes a while for government policy to catch up with tech innovation, especially at the speed at where you know, technology is innovating. And I use it from the other side in government. Um, so I think the, the second key point is that you need to be 
as a tech entrepreneur, you need to understand where the concern is coming from, from the government side. So, for, for example, for you know, food delivery companies, a lot of government institutions are concerned about safety of the, you know, the quality of the food, causing you know, uh, safety among the citizens. Uh, for Airbnb's case, it was about you know, the community, the, the, you, know, you don't have rowdy uh, communities, or you don't want people, uh, uh, guests to destroy host houses. Um, so it's important to paint some of these concerns uh, and how to mitigate some of these concerns in the light of the, lang the language where policymakers can understand. And I think it is helpful to have an enlightened government as well. So, you know, one, one of our case studies is, you know, we, we're partners with a company called Gojek, which is a platform company in Indonesia. Uh, you know, one of these days, you know, the Minister of Transport, uh, you know, declared a ban on uh, ride-sharing and, and specifically Gojek. Within, uh, I think, four hours, uh, President Jokowi tweeted, said, you know, Gojek is essentially to the livelihood of Indonesians. So, essentially, the ban was reversed. And, you know, it, it was... Uh, it was a great testament to the, to the importance of uh, the senior leadership in, in, among governments recognizing the power of tech innovation. Yeah, I'm not sure I've got anything further to add, actually. I think I, I agree with everything you guys are saying. I think at the end of the day, it's about, it's about intent. Uh, quite frequently, if, if, if regulation is simply catching up, I think that's less of an issue. I, I think if you take the example of, the, of food delivery, for example, you know, if the regulations for food delivery are really to ensure that uh, people don't get sick because food's been sitting around for too long, I think if, if a company isn't properly meeting those and uh, to the extent that people could get sick, that, that would be something that would worry us. But if the regulations are out of date, actually they're doing something else, that means that uh, the regulations are actually out of date, uh, there's really no danger to public health, that, that wouldn't worry us as much. Okay, that's great. Well, look, the one thing which is coming out of these stories a little bit is you are on a personal level seem to be very involved with the companies and you're proud of them, you're going along a path with them. How just, and I guess this is more a question of not your firm, but you personally, how do you then feel about the dispassionate decision to exit and when does that come and how do you think about it? Because it's very exciting to help a company succeed, but then ultimately your business model means you, you need to move on and, and find the next one. And, and that's, uh, is that, is that, uh, does that matter at all to you? Or is that, uh, is that just part of the business maybe? Uh, Tenko Asmal, we start with you. Yeah, I, I actually I have that problem not even on exit. I actually have that problem even on investing because I, I, you know, I, I am a bit of a tech geek at heart. And I, I have to be very careful when, when I see technologies that are interesting. Um, for us, it, the technology has to be interesting and it's got to make money. So I, we, I, I think that the discipline is making sure that no matter how much you like the founders, no matter how much you like the technology, at the end of the day, it's got to be something that you're confident will get you the returns that you think are commensurate with, with the risks. So at some level, even, even on investing, you actually have to be dispassionate. Uh, and if you get that right up front, then even when you have to exit, um, then you have to exit. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean if you exit an investment that you won't remain friends afterwards and so on. So I, I think I, I, I tend to see that as something I think is a, is a given. Okay. So I think a few points. I think first point is that at Sequoia, we are, you know, very long-term oriented, you know, for, for, for companies that we have, partnered with, and we like to think of ourselves as business partners rather than investors, you know, the, the glory of, of you know, the pride of course belongs to the entrepreneur, but I think we like to be the, you know, entrepreneur's first call when there's, you know, something happens, you know, they, we share with their sorrow, and we try to create a line of interest uh, with the entrepreneur. So, I think that's, that's the second point. I think third on exit, actually I asked uh, Nick Nash, who was in the audience just now of Garena, on this, on this point, and he, uh, and he gave me a very good answer, which was that, you know, uh, uh, IPO or even uh, m and is just a you know, significant financing event for the company. I think, uh, I think at Sequoia especially, I think our goal is to build long-term enduring companies and if the, if, the, if, if, if the best path to do that is to list a company um, such that it can attract better talent, you know, uh, have uh, enough financing um, to, to grow it even further, then you know, it's just part of the process of building a long-term enduring company. We'll call any, anything you would like to add? I'll keep it short. I think as investors, um, our passion for returns should always be greater than our passions 
for anything else, and in particular, a particular you know, a specific company. I think as Venku pointed out, you absolutely have to be dispassionate all along. You know, there are hard decisions to be made at some of these companies. And, uh, and so I think that uh, in all honesty, the passion for returns has to be greater than the passion for any specific opportunity. Okay, great. Changing tack a little bit and, and maybe starting with, with you, Mukul, is countries like the United States and China, ben, uh, maybe China has more languages than the US, but they are large markets where you're facing predominantly one set of regulation. I know they're state or provincial, and in, in China there's, there's many languages, but you do benefit from very large markets. Um, and that has created some of the most exciting companies, you know, whether it's Alibaba or Google, has helped huge companies start in, in those huge markets and then, then go global. The, the one question is when people think and talk about Southeast Asia, are there characteristics that make it one market, or is it all a collection of individual comp uh, countries that makes it so complex that there are limited synergies from having a Southeast Asian clay? I think the answer is yes to both, right? It is a common market and it is not a common market, right? There are certain aspects which are common. There are certain synergies uh, that you can create. And for certain businesses, especially if you're distributing a digital product in particular, um, I think it is, it is fundamentally easier because you don't have to deal with physical logistics. On the other hand, if you have to deal with physical logistics, of course, you know, uh, Indonesia is different from Malaysia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the answer is, um, uh, it's the tyranny of the and, which is that what you can centralize, what you can regionalize, what you can combine, you do, and what you can't, you distribute in specific countries. Um, I do think uh, you know some of the opportunities may be subscale on an individual country level, and therefore merit a pan Southeast Asian approach. There are other opportunities, and just to take some specific examples, right? The, the, the travel opportunity in Thailand is disproportionately large. And that's a function of, you know, Bangkok is the fourth most visited city in the world, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, the e-commerce opportunity in many of these individual geographies where population and internet penetration is high is, is substantial. Um, so I think you have to take a sector approach. Um, some things will make sense on a country level. But for a number of opportunities, uh, final, final sort of call out, you know, the, the, there's a lot of reference made to U.S. companies and large markets. Um, it's interesting. We did the math, and, and our assessment is that the aggregate travel opportunity in Southeast Asia is slightly larger than the gross merchandise sold on either Priceline or Expedia, right? So now to create a company of that size, you have to go Pan-Asia. So, so I guess, you know, in summary, what I'd say is that um, um, regionalize where you can, um, but you have to be very mindful that these are disparate ge geographies and require a disparate approach for, for most things that you would be doing. Yeah, I just have uh, two more data points to add. We should, actually, we did some research on uh, where has the market cap been created in Southeast Asia. And before uh, 2010, I think 90% of the uh, market cap was in regional companies. And 75% of, of this number is actually... That comes from two cities, which is uh, KL and Bangkok. Uh, you know, look at iProperty and, you know, Patrick is here and some of his companies that he's created. I think going forward, it will be uh, a bit more distributed, you know, with, com with countries like Indonesia um, increasing, uh, increasing to the mix. I think the second data point here is that on cross-border commerce, uh, it's a very interesting fact that we see that, uh, so you know, South Asia has about 25% of the world's population. Um, but an uh, interesting data point is that 95% of the trade is actually, uh, you know, us trading with people outside South Asia. And only 5% of the trade is intra-South Asia, uh, which, which suggests that if we, have, if we can uh, leverage cross-border commerce sufficiently, I think the, the headroom for growth is much higher. I mean, Southeast Asia is actually a very... Uh, diverse market actually. If you, look, if you look at all the different countries, they're all at different levels of development, the languages are different, and actually the, the, the culture is quite different as well. Uh, but there are a lot of commonalities between them. If you look at, you know, Vietnam and Thailand has, have got a lot of things in common. Uh, Thailand and Malaysia have got certain things that they do quite similarly. Malaysia and Indonesia have a lot of similarities between them. 
but if you look across them, they're, they're all fa fairly fragmented. So, uh, you know, yes, it is very different, and the culture in each country is different, but you get synergies, I think, by recognizing the differences and leveraging where actually cultures are quite similar. Uh, and I think if you look at the difference between, uh, you know, companies that come out of the US or Europe trying to apply the same business model that they had within this region, uh, they typically don't succeed very well. I think the, the companies that we see that, that succeed more are those that really recognize the different cultures and adapt the business models to the, the prevailing uh, culture in each country. Actually, following on that, Tekul, I mean, one question that I wanted to ask that I find a little bit interesting. If you look back, and I'm, I'm happy to be challenged on this premise if, if you disagree with it, but if you look back to the 1980s and you look at tech investing, people were investing in semiconductor firms and software firms that were solving hugely technical problems where maybe, you know, I'm trying to, I don't know, move to a 300 millimeter wafer, or I'm trying to create equipment to do that. These are problems that maybe we're going to fail in pure R&D, real technical stuff, right? And they are trying to solve a very hard technical problem. A lot of the great companies that have come out of Asia innovated business models, did huge things, creating new markets, but a lot of the technical stuff is kind of execution, right? Making the, sure the website, yes, you need to find good engineers to get the website up and running and do it what you wanted to do, it. but you weren't solving something where you thought, oh, if I don't get the right PhD, this may never work. It, it's more of an execution problem. In the US, we are seeing, again, some artificial intelligence, big data, people who are, again, coming up with things that are real technical problems. Are, are you seeing more companies in Asia as well that are doing, you know, approaching things that are much more of a technical problem rather than an execution problem? Well, it's, a good, it's, it's a good question. I, I think uh, at, to, to a large extent what you say is true. And I think it is a reflection of the different levels of development. Uh, if I, you know, I, I can't compare the level of development in R&D in Malaysia and in the US, where really a lot of the, the more difficult technical stuff, much more of that happens in the US than, than in this region. And I think that's, that's the reality of it. Uh, but you know, as, as investors, I think, again, how interesting or how difficult the technology is, is in some ways uh, not really relevant. It's really about what value do you create and if, if uh, software uh, creates that value, then that's where investors will go. In fact, in fact, conversely, I think what, what we find actually is these days, investing in software becomes difficult because there's a whole clamor of people saying, you know, take my money, take my money. Uh, whereas nowadays, when, when, when you see companies that have got something that's a little bit technical, uh, as an investor, if you like it, it's, it's a lot easier to do the investment because you don't have this huge queue of people um, wanting to do it because people tend to be used to doing the simpler stuff. Mm. Having said that, uh, if, if you look at, for example, uh, some of the stuff that goes on in Penang, uh, there's a lot of very technical R&D stuff that goes on uh, in Malaysia. Uh, you know, most people probably don't know, but, but you know, the first Pentium chip that came out, I don't know, many years ago, 50% of the R&D for the Pentium chip was actually done out of Penang by Intel. Uh, but we don't hear about it because uh, for Intel, this, this is stuff that's done by people, uh, you know, Malaysian engineers who are hired by Intel, by Intel. Intel doesn't really care whether the R&D is done out of the US or, or Europe or, or Malaysia or Singapore. Uh, for them, it's just a multinational business. Uh, it might be cheaper they can get it done in this part of the world, which is why I think uh, so much of it is done here. Um, but they don't need to talk about it, because as far as they're concerned, it's, it's, a, it's a global operation. Uh, so there's a, actually a lot more of that stuff going on, but a lot of it's actually done by multinationals in the region, so it's not really talked about as much. Yeah. I'm actually going to follow on as, as we move down the line here with a follow-up question to, to alter a little bit as we go down the line. Is There was one of your competitors that said something very interesting to me a few years ago, and he used to invest solely in semiconductors. And, his, his, uh, and now he does none, and he does only kind of internet-based business models. And his argument was to tape out a chip, to create the first prototype chip, cost a minimum $20 million. Um, 
I need a market size of six to eight hundred million dollars to even have a chance of making the returns I want, and that company has to win in that market. That's a very hard thing to do. I can put those twenty million dollars he was doing slightly earlier stage in five million dollar chunks in four companies, and I can have a much better risk adjusted return, so I'm done with semis even though he had a lot of knowledge in it. And, and I think, as, as you were saying, is a lot more corporates are doing that kind of investing in R&D now. And so the, do you think that's a, that, that trend will continue, or do you think external financing will, will come back to, to some of this harder stuff as well? Sure, mm. I, I can follow up on that. Actually, Sequoia's roots were in semiconductors. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we were first partners of Cisco and a, few, a lot of other semiconductor companies. And I think, I think one of the key learnings is that, I think I agree with your first question, that I think the latest you know, container company, the latest semiconductor company is still going to come, largely come from the Bay Area, um, because an industrialization happened 40 years ago in, in, in the US. But I think industrialization is now happening in emerging markets like India, Indonesia. So you, you are starting to see you know, very interesting business model innovation coming from our part of the world. And if you draw a circle around you know, India, China, Southeast Asia, Japan, more than half the world's population live inside the circle, than outside the circle. And as a result, you know, companies like the Airbnbs of the world, who was just you know, in, in 20 years ago, they were just focused on US and Europe, they now realize that, hey, they need to win the circle. They need to find uh, investors who can help them win the circle. They need to hire people who can help them win the circle. And even within the circle itself, they need to connect the, the dots a, a bit better. I think that's where uh, the opportunity we see, you know, that's why we sort of drifted away from semiconductors to figuring out how to connect the global dots, and that's, a, that's why we have global offices. And I think uh, to your second point on um, um, capital efficiency, I think w one thing we have seen is that, uh, you know, the, the, with the rise of, you know, smartphones and, you know, AWS, the cost of innovation has, has dropped dramatically. So the power has shifted away from financiers like us to actually the entrepreneurs. So it's shifted away from people who has money to people who has ideas. And you know, I think my partner, uh, Shalindra, has a very interesting way to uh, describe this phenomenon, which is that to capture the, the opportunity in, in this circle, and there's three kinds of companies. There's the, there's the clones, there's the mutants, and there's the new species. And I think what we see is that the, the clones will, will do okay, uh, but it's the mutants, the, the, those that actually adapt, um, establish business models from the West, but localizing them, and also the new species, they'll do particularly well. Actually, Mukul, there's, there's an interesting point I want to pick up on and, and, and take your point is, it's, it seems to be absolutely true, and I saw a really interesting TED talk, it's the lowest cost ever to set up a uh, company now. So you, you, know, you, can, you can be cloud-based, you don't even have to worry about servers anymore, et cetera. And in some sense, as you were saying, for some companies, it puts the power more on entrepreneurs because the overhead is lower. The, the flip side of this is there are so many great investments all three of you have made where capital was a massive competitive weapon because you were in kind of winner-takes-all markets and um, capital in terms of being able to deploy it and get to the network effect and, and win was really crucial. And I guess just hearing a little bit of your observations in it in no particular direction, but it, it must also be a little bit scary if you're fighting that fight, throwing capital at it, making a loss on every item sold. How do you judge whether you're making the progress, whether you will win, and, and when, to, when to stop deploying the capital? Yeah, I think, I think there's kind of multiple factors. So one is capital intensity is not a bad thing. Right? If, if capital intensity is, in fact, a good thing for an investor if you can get a return on it. Yes. Right? So, so I think, I think you know, a, a lot of investors recoil at capital intensity. I think the question is, 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 is there a return on the capital that's being spent? That's kind of the critical question. So that's number one. Um, number two is, um, you know, to, to your question earlier, which I'll, which I'll weave into my response to this one, there's a natural evolution of industries where um, sort of this power law applies where over time value starts to accrete to fewer and fewer players, right? So, so today you have TSMC um, in, in, in its segment, you have Intel in its own segment, back to some of your semiconductor uh, examples. Uh, but on the other hand, artificial intelligence, which is a, you know, sort of a, a, a hard technical problem, 
the jury is out on whether you know one of the many many startups that are trying to focus on AI will win, quote unquote, win, or Google will win, or Amazon will win, right? So I think I think it's more around an evolution of industries and kind of the the, the, the phases that they go through, uh, and that's where as investors we can be competitive with capital, which is to seek some of these opportunities. And at different stages, even on this panel here, there are different stages represented. I think we have to look for value creation at each of our stages. Um, you know, I don't think any one of us here, um, I, I'll speak for myself, I, you know, today telecom is a very, very, um, uh, uh, back to the power law, is a, is a very concentrated industry where value is being created. It makes less and less sense to go and you know create a new telecom company today, just as it does for semiconductors. Um, to your to your to your direct question about you know making losses on every incremental transaction, which which is true, I think you know the way we think about investing is like everybody else. We want to go after big problems. We want to find you know passionate entrepreneurs. But one lens which we've used um, very very um, uh, carefully is that of a path to profitability, right? And this has been, you know, I, I, I will admit in front of a relatively large audience, I've missed on a number of stories that have gone well for equity holders, um, despite not having a clear path to profitability, because we were very insistent on knowing what that path was, right? Now, you don't have to be profitable today, but you have to tell me how you get from here to there. Um, and, so, and so I guess the, the, the answer to your question is, if we have comfort in the path to profitability, um, we're not afraid of capital intensity. We're not afraid of sort of you know deploying large capital. And in fact, if anything, as you pointed out, large capital base that we can bring to bear actually becomes a strategic advantage. Yeah. Okay. Great. I think I think this is you know it's really interesting. Maybe just to talk then a little bit about measurement, and we're we're going to work our way to valuation just just before we go. But um, Yingyang Mukul mentioned something that I think a, a lot of investors think about is what's the path to profitability and a simplistic measure in the past has always been and we need to keep it a little bit simplistic I know each situation is different but to look at gross profit uh, if you're spending lots of marketing dollars you can justify that but if the gross profit is wrong then you know fundamentally how how can you ever scale to a level where where you are making money is that a very outdated view or does that still even apply today I think it depends on the industry. I think we don't necessarily look at gross profits. I think what we look at is unit economics per, per industry. So for example, you know, for e-commerce, right, you will look at you know, not only just uh, gross margin, but contribution margin to you know, number of purchases per year by the consumer. You, know, you look at uh, average order value and, 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 and look at the you know, lifetime value. So I think for SaaS businesses, a different metric applies. For video, a different set of metrics applies. So I think if, uh, what, one thing we look for is, I think to Muku's point, is uh, a path to profitability, uh, whether the unit companies will converge in the end. We will, we will sometimes take a, a very long-term view if it's the, the market size is large enough for a longer time horizon for the market, you can, you know, unit economics to, 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 to converge. Um, I think the second, the second point which I wanted to bring up, um, which Muku brought up, is the power law. I think the the one thing we learned was that um, the, with the application of the power law, uh, it's no longer sufficient to just cut checks. You can't, you can't make money, you know, money is commoditized. You can't, you, can't, you can't differentiate yourself by just cutting checks. And as a result, you, know, you need to bring to bear what, what, is, uh, what is differentiated from your capital than others. So it, whether it's leveraging your network, whether it's giving the companies the correct guidance, you know, as Sequoia, one of the things we, we have tried to do is we have a whole team of portfolio services which provides, you know, marketing, you know, uh, talent recruitment, uh, tech support uh, to companies at no cost. And I think that combined with sort of the, the earlier point on simply just providing capital is, uh, is, is the question we think about. So whether the combination of Sequoia plus a company can lead to a long-term enduring company. Actually, um, Teko, just picking up on, on this a little bit, the, the one thing which is fascinating to see, and this is picking up on one of Mukul's points, is that you're getting some huge ecosystems being created. And, and I don't know if it plays into the investment decision, but if you look, let's take Alibaba as an example. Alibaba has a fantastic money market fund offering for investors where they don't necessarily 
need to make money on that compared to banks that offer a competing product because the benefit to the ecosystem is so large they can make that money elsewhere in the ecosystem. So the, the one interesting question, I guess, is as you work through this here is there are some entrepreneurs who are building fantastic businesses that have huge value as part of an ecosystem, but when they do come into the ecosystem, they don't need to make money at that part because the money can be made at another piece. How do you think about you know, valuing the different pieces of a, of a large, complex uh, ecosystem as you look at it? Yeah, well, you know, I, I used to work in an airline, right? Uh, a, value, a very valuable part of the ecosystem. The airline never makes any money and everyone else does. Uh, so I, for us, uh, when we look at a, 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 a company that, say, may have three or four different product lines, uh, we would tend to look at it as a whole, as, as an entire ecosystem. So it's not necessarily important that every business line uh, makes money. Uh, if, if one of the business lines, say, doesn't make money but actually actively supports the other three, uh, that's fine. Right? Uh, so, you know, I, I, think, I think you have to look at it as a, as a whole. Because uh, un unless if, if it's a company on its own and it benefits other people, but it, it itself has no way of monetizing the benefits it gives to other people, then you know, that would make a very poor investment. But I think as, whenever we evaluate investments, we, we tend to look at it as a whole. And as long as we're confident that the whole makes money or has got a path to profitability, uh, I think for, for us that's, that's fine. I think we have time for one more question, so I wanted to just, on behalf of the audience, say thank you so much for, for taking the time. There, there are some you know, young men and women in the audience who are entrepreneurs. What, what's their best way to get hold of the three of you or to come to your attention or prepare for a first meeting if they're lucky enough to get a meeting with the three of you? What do, what do they do to try to stand out? Maybe uh, give them one anecdote each. Maybe, maybe I'll start. Uh, so for us, we, we tend to be uh, more late stage investors. So, so we tend to look at probably series D and E. Uh, maybe earliest we would, we would do is probably series C. So by then, you know, a company would have been around for a little while, uh, may not have necessarily been profitable yet, but at, at least should have been able to prove that there is a business there to be made. So for us, the things that we look out for is, one, wh how far have you progressed? What, uh, what, where has the journey uh, got you from the beginning to where you are? One is it helps us to understand the traction within the business model, but also helps us to understand the quality of the management team as well. Um, if you've had to pivot along the way, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, quite frequently, it's a good thing. It shows you know, adaptability. Uh, but then from then onwards, uh, one of the key things we'll need to understand is that where are you going to take the company? Uh, I think we mentioned, you know, path to profitability. You may not be making money today, uh, but we have to be confident that there is a very clear path to where you are going to be profitable. Uh, what are, where are the competitors out there? How are you planning to address the competitive pressures? You probably still need to grow quite a bit more to become profitable. Where are you going to get that growth? Where is it coming from? And what are the things that you are planning to do to achieve that? Uh, and really, where do your numbers stack up? Right? So, so all those things are, are the sorts of things that we really look at whenever we ev evaluate an investment. Thank you. Yeah, I think for us, we, we strive to be the first institutional business partner you know, of uh, someone who wants to build an enduring business. So that's never uh, too early you know, for for you to come chat with us. I, I, I must add that, you know, one of the most frequent routes that, you know, companies can introduce to us is through some of our portfolio companies. So typically what happens is, you know, we, you know, for example, we, we, we partner with uh, KFIT in Malaysia. So when Joe says, hey, you know, there's this really interesting Indonesia, uh, Malaysian company you should take a close look at, you know, it immediately goes up, you know, in, 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 in priority, you know, in our radar. Uh, so I think one, that's a, a very uh, common um, uh, route. But at the same time, we, we love to meet with uh, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs uh, you know, to, to see how we can also shape 
um, some of their thinking. Because one of the things we, we, we see a lot is what's happening in China, what's happening in India, what's happening in US. So, you know, uh, it, it, we, we help, can help some of these entrepreneurs connect the global dots even at a very early stage. So, yeah, come, come chat with us. And I think Peter, one of my co colleagues, is in, the, is in the audience as well. You know, I have very little to add. I think it's been well said. I think uh, we're also late stage investors. Uh, and as a consequence, I think a lot of what Tenku said is, it applies to us as well. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say maybe two other things. Keep, keep presentations short. Um, uh, you know, get to the point quickly. Um, and very rarely is the point uh, that I've built a better mousetrap than the other guy. Um, I think I think a lot of businesses I think unfortunately get lost in trying to prove that theirs is the best mousetrap. We're not looking for the best mousetrap. We're looking for the best business, uh, and that has elements that go beyond you know technology, product. It has everything that Tenku called out, which is you know your traction, your path to profitability, etc. But but get to those things quickly, uh, and I think you'll have our attention. Fantastic. I wanted to say thank you so much for your insights and really appreciate it. Thanks all three of you.